So quickly, let's look into what we have for today. Today, we are going to be talking on standing on grace part two. Standing on grace part two. And we begin from Galatians chapter 5 from verse 1. Galatians chapter 5 from verse 1 says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ had made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. You are fallen from grace. So I try to explain to us the last time, what does it actually mean to fall from grace or to stand on grace? You know, the opposite of falling is standing. If you are not falling from grace, that means you are standing on grace. What does it actually mean to stand on grace? And I say to stand on grace simply means to live by faith because everything in faith or sorry everything in grace has to be by faith if it is not by faith it is sin anything that is not done out of faith becomes sin and we see that in Romans chapter 14 verse 23 if it is not by faith, it becomes sin. So for you to stand on grace, whatever thing you do, you must do it by faith. Are you in Romans chapter 14, verse 23? He said, And he that doubted is damned if he eats, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Give me also Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. The scripture says, in Galatians 3, 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by the just shall live by what so who are the just we that are saved that are born again we are just that word just means justified anyone that is justified shall live by faith that is what it means to stand on grace but you know actually i have also taught us in this place that faith is not believing alone. Faith is actually believing plus action. Have I taught us like that here? Let's see it in, in James chapter 2, verse 26. James chapter 2, verse 26. So the Bible tells us that as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. That works there means action. So if your spirit leaves your body, no matter how beautiful the skin looks, it's already dead. And that is what the scripture is saying, that works is the spirit that gives life to your faith. You cannot, there are many people that say, ah, I believe, I believe it's possible. Yes, I believe. And they do nothing. That believing is just a dead believing. It is what you do that makes the life, that makes the faith come alive, become alive. But now, where, it is the, where the difference comes within, in the law and in grace, under law, is that they just do it anyhow. Whether they have understanding or they don't have understanding, they are doing it. Okay, they say we should do this. We let us go and do it religiously. 
Whether faith, whether you believe, you don't believe, just do it and it is accepted. But here, under grace, if you don't do it by faith, it becomes a sin, actually. It's not that you will not do it again. You will still have to do it, but now you are doing it with understanding and by faith. You know that, ah, this is what I want to do because I believe in God. Because of the faith I have, I'm doing this. Praise the Lord. And so that is what makes it acceptable under grace. And so now, the question is, what is the work that we should do to stand on grace? Remember, we are talking about standing on grace or activating grace in another way. I've told us again that grace is not free. Is not free. I mean, it's not, you know, this is where we make mistakes. We think that because Christ has died and released the grace, everything is just free. Like You have to activate it. You have to, otherwise it will not work. Now, if grace was free, why are there many people in the streets that are not saved? If grace was free, then everybody should be saved. If it is just like that. No. You have, because they have not activated it, because they have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, they are not saved. But you that have believed, you are saved. That means you activated that grace. And I have also told us that there are, there are five points of grace. You can activate one and lack in the other four. It doesn't mean if you activate one that the other four is already working for you. Now, have you not seen that there are many good Christians, I mean good believers, talking, very good. They are saved. You know they are born again, but they are poor. Have you not seen? Why are they poor? Because they have not activated the grace for prosperity. They have activated the grace for, for, for righteousness, or maybe the grace for healing, or maybe the grace for dominion, but that grace for prosperity has not been activated. So that one is not working for them. And there are people that are good Christians, they are rich. I mean, they, have, they know how to activate the grace for riches, but the devil is tormenting them. They have not activated the grace for dominion. Have you not seen? So if grace was just free, then every Christian would have been millionaires and billionaires, and nobody would be sick in the church, and the devil will not torment any Christian if grace was free. But grace is not like that. You have to with understanding, learn how to activate it. That is how to stand on grace. Praise the Lord. So now, my question is, what do we do? How do we activate that grace? And I took us to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 16. We read it before, but I want us to read it again. Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So the faith we are even talking about is the faith of Abraham. The blessing we are talking about is the blessing of Abraham. Now, of course, I know that it is the blessing of God. It is the faith of God. But why he's saying is the blessing of Abraham is that Abraham is the connector. God gave it to Adam in the first place. Adam fell. Adam mismanaged it. And God found Abraham and gave the same. If you look, when God promised, blessed Abraham, it is... The same blessing that he blessed Adam. You remember when God created Adam, he said, be blessed, be multiply, and be fruitful. The same blessing he gave to Abraham. So Abraham managed it well. So that's why it is called the blessing of Abraham. Not that Abraham originated it. It would have been called the blessing of Adam. But Adam failed. You, you understand me? So now the point I'm making is, if it is the blessing of Abraham, if it is the faith of Abraham, then Abraham is the best person to look at his life and see how he activated a certain grace in his life. And we can confirm that in John chapter 8, verse 39. John chapter 8, verse 
39, where the scripture says, if Abraham is your father, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you will do the works of Abraham. So I'm saying we will look at the works of Abraham and we know, of course, Abraham operated in the Old Testament but it's still the same principle. Only we know how to place it under grace. Praise the Lord. So, now coming to grace, I told us there are five points of grace, just as a way of introduction. What was the first one? The, the grace for righteousness and healing at his back. That's the first place he released Grace and the grace for righteousness is activated by faith and confession. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart and say it with your mouth, you will be saved the same day. And we saw an example when Jesus was crucified on the cross. There were two thieves hanged on, on one of on, on the either side, and one said, Ah, this man. He say he's a son of God and they crucify him. He cannot even save himself. Save yourself now so he can save us. And he perished. And the other one said, ah, God, I, I recognize that you are the son of God. Please, when you go to your paradise, remember me. And Jesus said, today you will be with me. That day, even though he was in punishment, even though he was sick or he was crucified, but he went to paradise. So how to activate that grace is to believe and confess. And we saw that in, in the life of Abraham also. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, the scripture says, when God showed Abraham, look at the stars. If you can number them, that is how your seed will be. The scripture says, Abraham believed God and God counted it to him as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. Praise the Lord. So that is how to activate that grace for righteousness and healing. And the second one was the grace for the, the grace he released from his head. When they put the, the crown of thorns on his, on his head, the blood came out. He released grace for the blessing. And the scripture says in Galatians 3 verses 13 and 14 that Christ has become a cause for us that the blessing of Abraham may come upon the Gentiles. And how do we reactivate that grace for the blessing? And I told us it is by obedience. And we saw that in the life of Abraham, Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, 17 and 18. When God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac and he wanted to sacrifice his, the angel said, no, don't kill the son again. Because you have obeyed me, I will ble in blessing, I will Bless them. Okay? So, and the third one was the blessing, the grace he released on his hands. And I told us that that grace was the grace for prosperity. According to, Gal the, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, the scripture tells us that, for we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that even though he was rich, he became poor, that through his poverty, we might be rich. So that is the grace. And how do we activate that? By giving. We activate that grace by giving. Believe me, you cannot talk about kingdom prosperity without talking about giving. It is not possible. It is not possible. It is the deception of the devil that makes people think that when pastors talk about giving, they want to take your money. Believe me, it's... Except if you are okay where you are. But if you want to manifest kingdom prosperity, you have to learn to give. And last week, we talked about tithing. I was telling us that tithing is simply 10%. So, 10%. So, if you are wondering about tithing or not tithing, forget about the name tithing. Learn to give a certain percent of your income. Calculate your giving based on percentage. If it is 1%, know that you are giving 1%. If it is 2 or 3 or 4 or 10 or 20. So let the word 
of you know the the confusion that is going about tithing let it not confuse you for if you don't want tithing forget it but learn to give a certain amount but at the same time i also have to tell you the truth about tithing which i i dealt you know exhaustively well on tithing last week but i, I just want to add something to that to you that tithing is different from giving money to the less privileged. No matter how much money you give to the less, you know, I met a friend sometime. He was having so many challenges in his life. This week, his car broke down. The next week, the child is sick. The other one, they give him a parking ticket. The other one, I mean, so just a series of incidents, bad, bad incidents is happening in his life, happening in his life. I wanted to tell him because if you know me, I have never. I don't tell people about tithing. I don't come to ask you, do you pay title? But because of the situation he was going to, I was moved. I say, I asked him, really, do you pay tithe? Do you give your tithe to the church? He say, ah, no tithe. I give. I even give more than tithe to the poor. I give so that one. So I knew that he was. A, on the other side of the people that argue about that. So I didn't want to, you know, argue much with him. I said, well, well, number one, understand that giving money to the poor is different from tithing. Number two, if you think uh, I'm asking you about tithe, so you give me money, it's good that you, he's not a member of this church. I said, okay, it's good that you are not a member of our church. So take your tithe, go and give it to your pastor or to your church because that way all these things that is happening to you they are not normal they are not natural they are very strange to me that you'll be having a series of problems from one to another from one to it's not normal so he he just say no disregarded it but believe me up to today something something you know bad something very very terrible still happened to him and I don't know how long it will take people until they learn. You are seeing some, I mean, you are seeing it physically. And you are still, what are you, are, you give more than tight to the poor. Why do you give it to the poor? Now, let me ask you, if, if you are in Sweden, you are a businessman like me, you pay, your, you know, if you are working, in a, if you are employed in a company, the company deducts your tax before they pay you your salary. But if you are a businessman, you pay your tax by yourself. And the government uses the tax money to repair roads and lights. Will you now say, because uh, there is one street light that is bad on the street, let me use the, the money I, I wanted to use to pay tax and go and repair the street light so that I don't pay the tax again. You are, jo you are just joking. You are joking. The tax, the scout vacate will come for you. And the fact, who authorized you to go and touch the street light <laughs> in the first place? So this is what people do. You have your tithe, then you go and give it to the poor, thinking that you are doing good things. You miss, they mismanage things. So first, I want to let you know, tithing is different from giving money to the poor. Tithing actually is a system of honor to God. Tithing is a system of honor to God. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Tithing is a system of honoring God. Remember last week I told us that Jesus Christ is now our high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So when you bring tithe, you are honoring him as your high priest. That's number one. Number two is that according to Romans chapter 11 verse 16, can you show me Romans chapter 11 verse 16? This is very, very powerful. You, you have to learn this. Romans chapter 11, verse 16, the scripture says, if the first fruit is holy, the rest is holy. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now, I know that tithe is not first fruit, but it's the same principle. First fruit is actually a yearly, a seasonal offering, but tithe. So now... The point is that money, I don't know if I have taught us here in this place, that money is a spirit. There is a spirit called the spirit of mammon that is attached to money. So 
You don't know the money that you receive. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know who has touched it. You don't know what they have done with it. You don't know where it has gone from or the hand that has touched it or if, if it is uh, blood money that they are giving you or whatever. You don't know. Somebody, maybe you're a business person, somebody came and bought something from you and he, you sell and he gives you money. You don't know where that money is coming from. You don't know if it is coming from the coven. You don't know if they have used it for anything. There is a spirit attached to that money. Paying your tithe from that money sanctifies the rest. That is what this scripture is saying. If the first fruit is holy, the rest is holy. And that is why, like I told you, that my friend, that is keep, he keep on having problem upon problem, one series of problems to another. Because this, the first fruit, he has not separated the first fruit. He has not separated the tithe to make it holy. And then the other one is just you know, today the car is broken, tomorrow the fridge is destroyed, is uh, bad, you are repairing the fridge, computer is broken, before you finish repairing the computer, you have headache, you go to hospital to buy Avidon, before you finish buying Avidon, I mean, series of problems, before you know it, even the money you will spend will be, will be even more than, than the tithe you, you are struggling to pay for. Praise the Lord. Anyway, let's go ahead today. I want us to look at point number four. What is point number four? If you are following me, what is the grace where Jesus re released grace number four? The side, no, side was the last one, the fifth one. On the, on the feet, he released, when they pierced his feet, he released grace there because blood came out. Now, the feet of Jesus were bruised, so your own feet will be made strong. So your own feet will bruise the head of the devil. You remember I told us that Jesus was made sin so that we will be the righteousness of God, right? He carried the cause so that the blessing will come upon us, right? He was made poor so that we will be rich, right? Now his feet were bruised so that your own feet will bruise the head of the devil. Give me Romans chapter 16 verse 20. Romans chapter 16 verse 20. The scripture says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. Shortly, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, do you see this? You know, on the other, in the other places we have read, it was expressly stated that this is the great, like in the case of prosperity, this is the grace of God that he was rich, so we'll be, uh, uh, he became poor, so we'll be rich. And the case of curse, he carried the curse so that the blessing will come upon us. But here, it's not written like that. But if we still look inside, we see that he said, the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet, then the grace, it means that it is connected to grace. For God to bruise Satan under your feet is connected to the grace of the Lord Jesus. It is the grace that Jesus released that will bruise the head of Satan under your feet. And how will that come? You know, we are talking about activating it. How do you activate that grace? How do you stand on it? Now, read that scripture again. Say, the God of peace. You know, God is also God of faith. He's God of uh, righteousness. He's God of favor. He's God of uh, holiness. But why did he use, stay there, why did he use the God of peace? It simply means that it is the peace nature, peace attribute of God that we activate the grace to bruise Satan under your feet. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that anything that publishes the peace of God we bring Satan under your feet. Anything you do, whatever thing you do that releases the peace of God, we bring, we give you authority over the devil. Praise the Lord. That is the God of peace. So now, let me show you from the scripture the things that can release the peace of God in your life. The thing that publishes the peace of God and then we close. I have maybe 10 minutes more. 
Number one, evangelism publishes peace and salvation. Go to Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. Evangelism, going for evangelism. Now, this is a mystery I'm sharing with you. Going for evangelism, having passion for souls, to see that souls are saved and brought into the kingdom of God, it publishes the peace of God. The scripture says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that said unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Okay, go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. Are you there? And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, the point, what I'm just trying to let you know is that, remember I said, anything that publishes the peace of God will bring Satan under your feet. And I'm saying that number one thing that publishes the peace of God is evangelism. Going for evangelism is publishing the peace of God. And anyone that takes evangelism as, as, as an assignment will always have authority over the devil. Praise God. Luke chapter 10 from verse 1. So let us see what Jesus did here. Luke chapter 10 from verse 1. The scripture says, After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whether he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest field. Now, Jesus called the 70 of his disciples and sent them to evangelism, right? So, that's number one. And then number two, he told them, pray, because this 70 is not enough. 70 people is not enough. He said, we need more because the harvest is small. He said, now, pray that God will bring more laborers into the harvest field. Second thing, praying for harvest of souls. Praying for salvation of souls is part of evangelism. And that will give you authority over the devil. You know, that is why we pray the way we pray in this church. Hardly, once in a while, okay, once in a while we pray like, Father, give me, or Father, do this, or... But hardly do we pray, let my enemies die, or let fire fall, or let this. Or mostly, most of our prayers is evangelism. Father, send harvest, send laborers into the harvest field. Father, let souls be saved. Father, you know, it's not by mistake that we are praying like that. It is because of the revelation that we have that praying for evangelism is part of evangelism, publishing the peace of God. And that is what will bring the devil underneath your feet. Praise the Lord. So learn to seek the kingdom of God. Now, number three, because of my time, I have to. If we read again that same scripture we read, uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 3 now, Luke chapter 10, verse 3, say, Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house you enter, first say peace. You see? Say peace, because they are publishing peace to this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain eating, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. So this is the third point I want you to understand. Giving or supporting evangelistic outfit, I mean purposely for evangelism, is the same as evangelism. Maybe you cannot go by yourself to preach or to do evangelism because you are busy or because of your schedule 
or because you are shy or whatever, you cannot go. And maybe you don't know how to pray for harvest of souls. You can give. Speci I don't mean for that thing. Specifically for evangelism. Because here, Jesus Christ told them, any house you enter, stay there. Whatever thing they gave you, eat. You understand that? So those people that are giving to the disciples who are preaching are also partakers and they are also laborers. They are also laborers in the harvest field. Praise God. And then let's see what happened in verse 17. The same Luke chapter 10 verse 17 to 21. When they have gone and they preached and they cast out devils, they healed the sick and they saw miracles, they returned. In verse 17, look, and the 17 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. It was when they were in the harvest field that the subject was under them. Praise God. It was when they were in evangelism that the devil was subject. That means God has crushed the devil under their feet. And look at what Jesus said. He said, verse 18, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Does that sound like grace for dominion for you? That is it. That is the grace for dominion. The power and authority to tread trample on snakes and scorpions and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I prophesy to you from this day forward, the devil will not torment you anymore. In the name of Jesus, even in your dream, any demon, any spirit that wants to attack you, even in the dream, you take authority over that demon from now on. In the name of Jesus. God crushes the devil underneath your feet from now on in the name of Jesus. That is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you will have power and authority over the devil. Trample on them and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That grace is activated for you this day in the mighty name of Jesus. Shall we be on our feet? That is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give me Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. God prophesying ahead of time. When Adam fell, when the serpent deceived Adam, deceived Adam and Eve to eat, eat the, the fruit, he asked them not to eat. And God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and you shall bruise his heel. And I'm telling you that the moment they bruised the heel of Jesus, the moment they crucified the feet of Jesus, he released that grace to bruise the head of the devil. But you need to activate it in your life. And the only way to activate it is through evangelism, publishing the peace of God. Because it is the God of peace that will crush the devil underneath your feet. And today, I want us to ask God for that grace for that passion for evangelism. We are going to pray. We have two, three minutes remaining. I want you to pray. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, grant me the passion for souls. Grant me the passion for souls. In the name of Jesus, go ahead and pray. Say, Lord, oh Lord, baptize me with passion for souls that I will go for evangelism that I will pray for evangel for loss of souls, for the lost souls to return to the kingdom, that I will give for the evangelism. Lord, that the devil will be subject under, my, under me and crush under my feet in the name of Jesus. Grant me the passion for souls, the passion for souls, the passion for souls. Let it burn in me, let it burn in me. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. We are going to pray again. Remember Jesus sent 70 people as laborers. Say, Father, 
make me your laborer in your harvest field. In the name of Jesus, go ahead and pray. Make me your laborer in your harvest field. Make me your laborer in your harvest field. Father, make me your laborer in your harvest field in this nation. Make me your laborer in your harvest field in this nation. In la kata zete reketia, akapate lete zete kia, akambra de zete kepalia, irekendo soto kopalia, arende gedia, arenge de gedia, ilege de gede gedia, ijege de gede gedia, ilege de gede gedia, jako patelia, make me your laborer in your harvest field, oh God, I will go for souls in the name of Jesus. Let that anointing come on me, let that power come on me, let that grace rest on me, let that spirit rest on me. He said that we receive power and that we become your, uh, your witness uh, when the, the Holy Ghost is come on me. Let that spirit come on me this day. In the mighty name of Jesus. We are going to pray and say, Father equip me and grace me ordain me to bear fruit that will remain in the mighty name of Jesus. Go ahead and pray. Ordain me to bear fruit that will remain Jesus said, I have ordained you, I have chosen you, and ordained you to bear fruit, and your fruit will remain. Father, let me begin to bear fruit that will remain. Let me bear fruit that will remain. Let me bear fruit that will remain. Let me bear fruit that will remain. Thank you, Father. Receive all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Finally, you are going to pray. Say, Father, Create opportunities for me that will enable me to evangelize. Cause me to meet souls that you have prepared for salvation in the mighty name of Jesus. Go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray. Father, cause me to meet souls that you have prepared for salvation. Create opportunities for me to meet the person that you have ordained me to meet. Great opportunities for me to evangelize. Rakando zete ke pariada, arege dege balaga do zete redigia, ango brandelia, ango brandelia, ango brandelia, ile condeliada, ajeke toleti zetelia. Father, cause me to meet that person that you want me to evangelize. Cause me to meet that person that you want me to minister to. Oh God, create opportunities for me. Give me the boldness. Give me the grace. Cause us to meet. In the name of Jesus, create that opportunity for us to talk. Father, by your grace, by your help, help me to know what to say. Help me to engage the conversation. Help me to know what he needs. Give me insight. Give me wisdom. Give me prophetic knowledge. Father, to minister to them. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Receive all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So shall it be for you this day in the name of Jesus. Amen. This day your field is short with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus said you shall receive power when that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Receive that power this day. Amen. In the name of Jesus. And as you witness and evangelize for, for, for Jesus in this land, the devil is subject to you. In the name of Jesus, your feet will always be on top of the head of the devil. In the name of Jesus, no more oppression of the devil in your life. Every attack, every oppression of the devil against your life today, they are canceled. They are destroyed. In Jesus' name. We pray. Thank you, Father. Receive all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Go ahead and give him a mighty hand.